we're going to dive into the Word this morning on this Resurrection Sunday. And uh, I believe God's got something for all of us to take home and really just chew on and just remember what this day is all about. Amen? Uh, so why don't you turn with me over to 1 Peter chapter 1. And what we have to understand about uh, uh, coming to church on Easter Sunday, and I realize on a Sunday like this that several of you probably were dragged here kicking and screaming and or bribed by something uh, yummy afterward. And, you know, we do have donuts, so that helps a little bit. But, but when we get together, every time we get together, it's to encourage and strengthen and help each other. And then when we celebrate Easter Sunday, when we celebrate Resurrection Day, this is like the Christian Super Bowl. This day right here. And we just, we're watching the same game on repeat and we know who wins, but we celebrate it anyway. It's when Jesus just scored all the points and then spiked on the devil at the very end. It's just, he just won everything for us. And so we celebrate that not only are, are, are we redeemed, but, but we get to live a life full of life here. But then, then in, on top of that, like the cherry on top is we get eternity with God forever. And there's just no better, there's no better story than that. And so uh, the interesting part about uh, when you're looking at the Bible and you're reading through the Bible is you see this, uh, this intricately weaved tapestry of God sh- uh, showing us and sharing with us that he wants relationship and he wants closeness with us. From the very beginning, when he created Adam and Eve, he wanted relationship and closeness with them. And, and, and they messed it up. And then we all, get, we all fell into sin and all of us have sinned. So, you know, it's not just Adam's fault. You've done some stuff too right? You have your own list. But you know what? God, who makes planets and stars and mountains and and pours out oceans and and trees and flowers and human beings in the intricate detail that, that we are, this God that created all of that knows us each individually by name and wants a relationship with us. He wants to know us personally. That's an amazing story. And to get that, and to get that back, what he had with Adam and Eve, he sent his most prized possession, his only son, to die in our place. And not only did he die, and he was in the grave for three days, but he came up on Sunday, and he rose from the dead. And we serve a living Savior. And that's why we're here this morning, is we're celebrating a living God. Because there's lots of prophets, and there's lots of gods that you can go around this earth, and you can find the tombs of where these great deities lived and their bones and their ashes are still there. But our tomb, our savior's tomb is empty still today. That's why we get excited. We serve the living God. So today I wanna share a little bit uh, with you about the living hope, the living hope, the, the plan that God initiated in Jesus to bring us a living hope. Are you there in 1 Peter? 1 Peter chapter one, uh, verse three. In the New King James, it says this, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a good, that's a good way to start any kind of prayer right there. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again into a living hope. Everybody say living hope. Living hope. A living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, let me read it to you in the Passion Translation. It says this, Celebrate with praises the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has shown us in his extravagant mercy. Mercy is when you don't get what you do deserve. Mercy is when he gives you what you, what you, should, he gives you, what you don't deserve, what you didn't earn, and, and he takes away what you should have gotten. That's mercy. And this says extravagant mercy. So God, who has shown us his extravagant mercy, for his fountain of mercy has, been, has given us new life And we are reborn to experience the living, energetic hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This is a living, energetic hope that he gives us for life. A living, energetic hope for life and what's beyond. We are created to live in this hope. Listen, what does this look like? It looks like this. When when we see that we need Jesus, and we say, okay, God, I'm surrendering my life. I, I don't wanna do it on my own anymore. It, it's a mess. There's all kinds of stuff. I, I'm not sleeping good. I, I know I'm not right with you. You, you finally say, you finally say, okay, God, have it. Have it all. Here I am. Come on, from that moment forward, you have a living hope on the inside of you, not just for this life, but for what's next. Again, this is the, this is the shortest thing. This life we live, this 
breathing in and out is the shortest thing we're ever gonna do for all of eternity. This vapor, this time we're here, and it matters for all of eternity. Do you see this? The living hope. God has promised us a living hope. Now look at Psalms chapter 33, verse one. Psalm chapter 33, verse one. It says this. It says, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice is just another way of saying rejoice. To rejoice, to bring your joy back up, to redo it again, to rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous. For praise, now this is the King James, the praise, for praise is comely for the upright. What does that mean? Comely means you look good. Praise and rejoicing means it looks good on you. When you rejoice in God, when you praise God, when you honor him for who he is, it looks good on you. Now, ladies, you remember that first time you saw your man in a tux? You remember this time? Some of y'all, it's for the first time you saw your man in that sleeveless flannel. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and you're like, woo, woo. You know what I'm talking about. Fellas, you know that, t- that time when she showed up in the dress. You know which one I'm talking about, right? And you're like, Lord, have mercy. And you used your best line. Your best line, are you hurt? Are you injured? Do you need help? Because I think you just fell straight out of heaven. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. You used them. That time when you saw her or you saw him and you were like, wow, come on. This is what we look like when we rejoice, when we praise God. It looks good on us. When we have a living hope on the inside of us, it looks good on us. You know that that people are more attracted to others that smile, that have a little spring in their step, have a little joy in their life. Are you you hearing me? Come on, you know who they are. We're we're supposed to have so much life on the inside of us that people are drawn to that. Why? Not just because of us and our purdy teeth, but because we've got life of God on the inside of us. This living hope is meant to, to well up on the inside. It's meant to come up from the inside and just produce life in us to those around us. It's a living hope. It's a living hope. Amen? Come on, we gotta just re, we gotta just rejoice sometimes and remember, God is taking care of me. He's good to me. He's good to me. Amen? Come on, say, he's good to me. It's a living hope. He told us that it was a, in the passion, he said it's a living, energetic hope. You weren't meant to be depressed. You weren't, you weren't meant to be pushed down. You weren't meant to live a life of misery. That is not God's plan for you. The living hope brings us out of the depths of that. It's God that does that. And he's the only one that can. Come on, you and I know, both of us, we know this, that we have tried to fill the God-shaped hole on the inside with other stuff. It doesn't work. And and you gotta understand from God's perspective, it's like he's sitting down with your toddler, right? And and we're the toddlers. And you got that little box thing where you're trying to fit the shapes in. You remember when your kid's like one and they're trying to jam the circle into the square and you're like, please God, (laughs) let them figure this out on their own, right? But I mean, that's what we're trying to do with with other stuff. We're trying to make stuff fit where the only shape that works is God. And that, that life-giving God comes in and all the other stuff doesn't make sense anymore. It won't work anymore because you found what you needed. It's a living hope. It's a living hope. Now let's look over at 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. When God is in our life, we are full of hope and it shows. Come on, we're celebrating resurrection day. 2,000 years ago, the disciples were like, where's Jesus? What? He's not in the grave and what? And then Jesus is showing up and he's, a show, and he's appearing to them. He's alive. Come on, you gotta understand, they went from desperation to excited, happy. Yes, he is the Messiah. Yeah. Man, for three days, they were really questioning whether or not Jesus was the one. Yeah. Now he's alive again. They're like, yes. Thank you, Lord, resurrection day. But there is more to come. I wanna encourage you in this. We serve a God who takes good care of us while we're here on the planet. He loves his kids. He loves those that love him. I'm telling you, he takes care of us. But this is not the only thing we have to look forward to. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. There's more than this. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 19, it says, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. That means that's a sad state for us. If this is all we have to look forward to in Christ is just what we get out of it here, what's the point? 
He's saying if, if everything ends when you die, and there are people on the planet that believe that, that when you die, you just go into nothingness. They believe everything came from nothing, and then when they die, they go back into nothing. So they merge with their creator. You see that? <laughs> Made from nothing, went back to nothing. I'm just saying that everybody's got, a, everybody's got theology. We believe in God. There's something after this. Thank you, Jesus. He says, if this is all we have, we're of, of, of all men, the most pitiable. And we are in a sad state. And he says, but now Christ is risen from the dead. When you look at this passage in 1 Corinthians 15, he's talking about the resurrection. He's talking about what's next. There is life past this place. We can live a full God-filled life here and now, and then we have eternity to look forward to. You realize that if, if Jesus doesn't come back soon, and I believe he is, but if he waits just a little bit longer, all of us, and I mean all of us, are not getting out of this thing alive. Anybody in the house from the 1800s? Raise, raise your hand. <laughs> 1700s, anybody? anybody? No, none of them are around, right? That means there's, there, this is gonna end at some point. This will end, but we serve a resurrected savior. And because he's alive, that means he's gonna raise us to new life. Amen. Even when our body goes to the ground, that's not over. That's not over. Everybody say, it's not over. It's not over. Come on, there's more to come for us. Amen. Are you with me so far? Have you guys ever looked forward to going on vacation? I mean, it's so, now when you plan it out and you know where you're going, somewhere warm and sandy and beachy or mountainous and rivers, I mean, just pick your spot. Just, you know, somebody told me they're going to Hawaii tomorrow and I just, I almost wanted to leave. <laughs> tomorrow, really? But when you plan a vacation, come on, you look forward to that. There's, there's something about you got to get some stuff done, but but you're looking forward to being gone and nobody's calling me and talking to me. I just get to relax and to rest. There's something about it, right? That's just, oh. this is how God wants us to think about eternity. We gotta be planning and thinking about what's next. Yeah. Do what we're supposed to do on the ground while we're still around. But then God has something really good for us and he's been planning it for us for a while. Yeah. How many of you know, if you're gonna pick a cruise director, if you're gonna pick up a, a, a vacation planner, like the top of your list would be God. Amen. He's good at it. He says he's prepared some things for us that we can't even possibly imagine. Are you with me? Are you guys awake? Yes. I mean, <laughs> resurrection means we, we have life in God now and we have life forever. Amen. To reject God and say no to that means you're saying, I don't want what God's prepared. I don't want that life after. I'm gonna take the alternative. And the alternative is to go to a place that wasn't created for you at all. It was designed for the enemy. It was designed for the devil to hold him up forever so he's never a problem for us again. And people are being deceived by the devil every day to say, you know what? I don't think I believe this God thing. I'm just gonna do my own thing. And by default, they choose hell for eternity. That's a scary thing, especially when we know what we know. There's no atheists in hell. Every single one of them now believe in God. Are you hearing me? Yes. So if you figure it out on this side, that's better. Because it's too late when you go over. There's no takey backsies. So we have, we have, as believers, we have a living hope that this isn't the end. There's more to come, Amen. Now, I've, on vacation, I have learned to relax, but I used to be the one that was running us all over the place. From the time we got to the hotel, there's people laughing because y'all have done this. Like, we're on a schedule. Let's go. We got to see all this stuff. Who wants to see the largest ball of rubber bands? And my daughter's like, what? Come on, let's go. We used to do this. We used to run around. Now we don't. My wife has helped me to relax, to calm down. There's plenty of time. There's plenty of time. In eternity, there's plenty of time. Millions of years. You can do it all. You can ride every ride. <laughs> if, the, if the only hope we have in this life, there's, there's no hope in what is to come, what good is it? What good is it? Come on, it's not just about here. We get the best of both worlds. Amen? Have you guys ever heard uh, uh, or made a bucket list? You guys heard of a bucket list? Anybody? Right? So those of you that haven't, I'm going to let you into a little secret. 
bucket list is a, a list that people make of all the things that they want to do or try before they're out of here, before they die or before they retire or before they get to, too old to do some of those things. There's a bucket list. And, and usually bucket lists uh, are extravagant. There's, there's quite a few things on there. They want to uh, uh, climb a mountain. They want to surf on the waves in Australia. They want to, you know, jump out of an airplane. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. They, they, they want to do some, some things that are outside the norm that, that just adds to this list. And people get really, I mean, they get really uptight about getting some of these things done. Like, you know, time's getting short or, or maybe they get a bad report from the doctor and like, we got to crack this thing out. Let me give you a little insight to those that are believers that love God and are gonna spend eternity with him. You have all the time in eternity to accomplish whatever it is that's on your heart. This is not the end. This is, this is where I find hope in this. There's things that I still wanted to do with my dad before, you know, before he died and he, he went home to heaven. Rascal, early. There's still things I wanted to do. But this isn't the end for me. Are you hearing me? This is a living hope. That means you don't have to try to get it all in while you're here. There's a lot to do there. See, we get this image, and this is from cartoon characters and and other things. We get this image that when we get to heaven, we're going to be laying on clouds. And people are going to be bringing us fruit bowls. (laughs) I'm like, don't bring me a fruit bowl. How about a ribeye and a baked potato? Come on, this is heaven. (laughs) Let's go. We get this picture like we're just going to be like, oh, it's going to be so boring. No, it's not. You are not going to be bored one second in heaven. Not one second. We're going to get a million years in and God's going to show us another thing he hadn't revealed yet. And we're going to all be like, ah, wow. A million years from now. This is going to happen over and over and over and over again. This is the God we serve. He's infinite. He's endless. We have a lot to look forward to. Come on, turn to somebody and say, I got a lot to look forward to. Turn to the other guy and say, yeah, you do too. You do too. Come on, we got a lot to look forward to. We, we got a God that says we have a living hope that we don't, we don't just make Jesus Lord and then we just try to get through life so that we can get over there. We can live for God right here and see God do amazing, wonderful things in our lives because Jesus was raised from the dead. Because of that event, there's new life in us. So we can live an amazing life here and now and we get eternity. Why would anyone say no to that? You hear me? And there's, there's thousands of people not in church right now in Spokane that think we're nuts. Why would you do that? Give up a Sunday when you got all these chocolate eggs and stuff to do? Like we know, we know, we know. There's a living hope in us. Something draws us closer to God. Come on now, are you hearing me? (laughs) Thank you, Lord. This life is not the end. Let me share just a couple scriptures scriptures with you. You don't have to turn here. But in 2 Thessalonians chapter two, in the New American Standard, it says, Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and a good hope by grace, may he comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. Come on, he's given us a hope and comforted our hearts so we can do everything we need to do in every good work and every good word. He wants to do that for you. It's up to you whether you receive it or not. It's up to us whether we say, okay, God, I I believe, I'm in. Show me what to do. He loves you. He's got a good plan for you. Amen. Everybody okay? Romans chapter 15, verse 13. It says, now may the God of hope, the God of hope, the God of hope. He's the God of hope. Means he knows how to do it. He's got hope figured out. The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. That's a good, that's good news. You need a little joy? You need a little peace? The God of all hope can fill you with that. But it doesn't come anywhere else. The world calls it joy. It's actually just their version of happiness. And happiness is fickle. Happiness ebbs and flows with all kinds of situations and circumstances. Joy is God-given and it stays steady in your life no matter what you're going through. The God of joy and peace will fill you in your believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. That living hope is supposed to well up and, and drive how we think and drive how we talk and, and really direct our lives. That this isn't the only thing we're ever gonna do. There's more to come. 
good stuff to come. We can walk in a living hope. Now look at this in Ephesians chapter two, verse 12. This is in the good news translation. This is Jesus before and after. It says this, and it says this about us before we had Jesus and then after we have Jesus. Ephesians 2, 12 says, at that time, you were apart from Christ. When you didn't know him, you didn't receive him, you didn't acknowledge God. You were apart from Christ. You were foreigners and you did not belong to God's chosen people. You had no part in the covenant. What's the covenant? Covenant is what God makes with us and says, what's mine is yours and what's yours is mine and we're gonna share and I'm gonna take care of you. That's a covenant. It's like a contract that's binding. He said, you had no covenant, no part in the covenant, which was based on God's promises to his people. And you lived in this world without hope and without God. That's where we were before we said yes to Jesus. We were without hope and we were without God. Without God. And in, in a lot of cases, we didn't even know it. We knew something was off. We knew it wasn't right. We knew things weren't like they should be because we have a God-shaped hole on the inside that only he can fill. And so we tried to fill it with relationships and kids and work and hobbies and food and substances and nothing seemed to work because we were without hope and we were without God. Listen to me, the people around us that don't know Jesus are without hope and they're without God. And if you're here this morning and you have not given your life to the creator, you have not given your life to Jesus, this verse says, You're without hope and you're without God. And that is not a place you need to stay. You can come out of that and choose today to say, God, I need you. I want hope and I want peace and I want joy. That's what I need in my life. That's what he has available for you. He said, you are without hope and without God. Then he says in verse 13, but now, now he's flipped the script. He said, now that you're in Christ, he says, in union with Christ, Jesus, now that you're in union with him, who used to be far away, that's, that's us. We used to be far away. We have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Let me read it one more time. But now in union with Christ Jesus, you who used to be far away have been brought near by the blood of Jesus. Jesus shed his blood on the cross. That blood covered our sin, not just covered it, washed it away. It took care of the sin problem. People are not going to hell for the sin problem. They're going to hell for rejecting Jesus. They're choosing that life because they won't say yes to Jesus. That's it. That's the one. Jesus took care of the sin problem. He dealt with it. His blood washed it away. Amen? So now we're, now, we're, now we're in. And it says now we used to be far away, but now we've been brought near by the blood of Christ. Now, in, in, before that, in Ephesians chapter two, earlier in that chapter, it says this in verse four. It says, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. I'm gonna say, God loves me. Say it with me. God loves me. Come on, his great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, he made us alive together with Christ. For by grace, we have been saved through faith. And he raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ that in the ages, everybody say ages. In the ages to come, he might show. In the ages, we don't even know how long that is. When the the Bible says ages, it doesn't put a time end on it. It's eternal. So what is this telling us? It says that Jesus, when Jesus was resurrected, God God resurrected Jesus. And when he did that, the Bible says, let me put it in in today's terms, God flexed. And God doesn't have to flex for nothing. I mean, he wiggles his pinky and like continents just shift. And stars get formed. God, when God raised Jesus from the dead, he he showed off. He fled because he he raised Jesus. But when he raised Jesus, he also raised all of us to new life, resurrected life. This is what he did in the resurrection. That's why the earth quaked and and tombs opened, not just Jesus tomb, but tombs around where Jesus was buried open and dead people that had been dead a while came out and came into the city. People were like, "Ah!" (laughs) this happened because God flexed. And when he raised Jesus, he raised us. That means there's coming a day when this body, this earthly suit we're wearing right here, that's how you get around is your earth suit. This is gonna, this is gonna be glorified and it's gonna look like Jesus' glorified body. Because when he was raised from the dead, he got a new body. The Bible says it was glorified. That means he can travel around and just teleport. He would be somewhere and he'd disappear and he'd show up somewhere else. How does he do that? I don't know. <laughs> but we're gonna figure it out because we're gonna be just like him. Be like, hey, Jesus, how do, you, how do you do that teleporting thing? How do we do that? I want to do that. 
You think this is goofy. It's not. It's in the Bible. I'm telling you. He just showed up in a room and the doors and the windows were closed. He walked through walls and he, and he jumped around and he talked to different people in his glorified body that they could touch and feel. He could eat. That's how they tested him. Give him something to eat. We want to make sure you can. Okay. Okay, it's really him. He can eat. Whew. This is what we're heading to. When, when Jesus was resurrected, we're resurrected. There's coming a day when every, every Christian, everybody that has called Jesus Lord will come up out of the grave and have a glorified body. And it'll look like, just like Jesus, his glorified body. Not a twin, but just the same components and material. We're gonna look like him, glorified. This is the hope we have, that we're not just living this life. There's, a, there's another one that's far better. Everybody say far better. far better. In the ages to come, come on. And then God is gonna show us. When God says he's gonna show us, that means he's gonna put on a show. And not just a show, he's gonna show us the show. This is gonna be the show. He's gonna show us what he did. He's gonna show us what Jesus did. He's gonna show us what that means to us. We're gonna get to see it with our own eyes, what it is that God did for us. I mean this passionately because I want people in this house and anybody listening online to know there is hope in Christ, that you don't have to keep slogging along in life. It's rough outside of God. It's rough when, when you're aliens and apart from him. It, it, it's so much better to know that God who makes planets and stars is on your side and he's for you and he loves you and, and he sent his son to die for you. And in all of that, he's resurrected us to new life and that this is not our permanent home, heaven is. Come on, we have a living hope. This should just change every Monday morning for us for the rest of our lives here. Monday mornings are no longer a drag. It's like, no, I got a living hope. I got a living hope. This is not the end for me. Amen. Everybody okay? <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. He says this. Jesus said that, that if we're ashamed before him, before men, he'll be ashamed before the Father. There's coming a day when we're gonna stand before God. This is gonna happen for every person. Every person. And, and the books are gonna be opened and the names are gonna be read. And I promise you, if you've not called on the name of Jesus, you've not made him your Lord, you're not written in the book. It's called the, the Lamb's Book of Life. If, if you've made Jesus Lord of your life, God's keeping track. He is, he is a very good accountant. He has never lost anybody, ever. He's keeping track. And you're, we're gonna be standing there and our name's gonna be called. And we're gonna look to Jesus. And Jesus is gonna do one or two things. He's gonna say, God, I, I don't know them. Father, I don't, I don't know them. I don't know them. Or he's gonna say, yep, Patty's mine. Philip's mine. Gary's mine. They're mine. Come on. This, this is, this is it, it, for him to say, no, I don't know them, that's, that's way worse, way worse than not being picked at recess. Way worse. Infinitely worse than not being picked at dodgeball. This is, the, this is the only one that counts. You want Jesus to know your name. You want him to stand up for you. And he says, if we're ashamed of him, and why, why did he say this? Because there's no such thing as a closet Christian. I, I just serve God in my own way. And, 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 you know, he knows my heart. And, you know, I at least know where my Bible is. Well, it doesn't work. Let me ask you this question. If you were put on trial today, they came in here, the Gestapo came in here and arrested all of us and hauled us off in the paddy wagon. You know what that is, right? It's the prison bus. Somebody like paddy wagon. <laughs> the prison bus, right? Hauled us off in the prison bus, took us to court and we're on trial for being a Christian. Is there enough evidence in your life to convict you of being a Christian? Yes. We gotta ask these questions. Uh, is there enough evidence that people have on us to say they gotta be, they gotta be? Or is it like, I never saw him pray. I never saw him read his Bible. I never even saw him go to church. I mean, is there enough evidence to convict? This is, the, this is what we're talking about. And I'm not talking about rules and trying to do all the things. I'm saying there's a living hope inside us that, that pushes us to something that should be evident to other people. Yeah. Sometimes it's just a smile. Because God's in you. Is there enough evidence to convict? We cannot be closet Christians. We cannot be ashamed of the name of Jesus. We cannot be ashamed. We want 
to know that we know that when we get there, Jesus is like, yep, I know him. That's, that, they're one of mine for sure, right? Not like, a, oh, let me look around. Let me double check the list. What, do you have that on another? You don't want him double checking. You want to make sure you're there. Are you hearing me? But if you are, you have a living hope, this life and the next. Isn't that good news? Well, someday we're resurrected. We're out of here. Bodies just like Jesus. We're going to stand before God, give an account. That day is coming. Make no mistake. How are we living our lives leading to that time? Come on, live it full with a living hope. Amen? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So I want to encourage you this morning. I know we've got people that watch uh, live on a regular basis and people that rewatch these services. And I know I've got a whole bunch of people in this church today. And I want to give you an invitation this morning that maybe you haven't had in quite a while or maybe you've never had. But God is pulling on your heart right now. When you come to a place like this and, and the Spirit of God uh, moves and speaks to hearts because of what he wants to say to you, something on the inside uh, stirs and says, I need to make, I need to make an, an adjustment. I need to make a change. I need to do something here. This is a decision point in your life that, that all eternity will recognize and you include it. Today is a decision point for you. If you have not made Jesus Lord of your life, if you haven't done it, if you've never done it, if you've never said yes to him, you've never surrendered your life to him, you've never said, God, I believe that Jesus is your son, that he died for my sins and you raised him from the dead. It's in the book. It's provable. It's there. You got a, you got a room full of people here that believe it. Come on. If you believe in Jesus, is he your Lord and Savior? Raise your hand. Come on, everybody, everybody. Look, there's a room full of people right now that already believe that Jesus is Lord and Savior. We're already on our way to eternity doing everything we can to follow him. But you got to come to the decision point of your own life at some point for you, not because you're in, in a church, not because you, you believe in God, not because you own a Bible, but because for you, you're going to say, you know what? From this day forward, my life is not my own. I'm serving the God who made me and loved me enough to send his son to die for me in my place. Jesus substituted himself for me and he died that horrible death so that I wouldn't have to be separated from God for eternity. That's what Jesus did. And if we come to a place like God, you can have it all. That's a point in eternity that's marked in your life forever. So the invitation this morning is to say yes to him, to stop doing it your own way, to turn your heart and life to him and just say, okay, God, I want you to have it. I want you to have it for my life. I want you to have it for my wife or my spouse. I want you to have it for my kids. I want you to have it for everything that I touch. God, I want you to have my life so that I can show the goodness of God everywhere I go and I can walk in a living hope every day of my life. You can have that a living God breathes hope in your life every single day. That's what he's offering. He loves you. He created you for this. So if you need this prayer, this is what we're going to do. We're all going to pray a prayer together. All of us. We're going to pray a prayer of commit, uh, committal. We're just going to say, God, I believe this stuff. I believe the word. I'm asking you to come into my life. We're going to pray this. And if you want to pray this with us, I'm encouraging you to do it because we're all going to be praying it out loud. But you've got to do it from your heart as a decision of your own will to say, God, from this day forward, I'm serving you. I see what you've done for me. I'm serving you. Amen. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Now, here's, here's what I want to do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look around for just a minute. Nobody else is, just me. This is the invitation for you. If you want to pray this prayer, I'm asking you, sitting in your seat between you and between me and Jesus, us three, you and me and Jesus, I'm asking you, if you wanna be included in this prayer, if you're saying, I'm, I'm making that decision today, I'm choosing that today, I'm asking you to do this. Just make eye contact with me. And if I can't see it, just slip your hand up where I can see it. I'm gonna look around, you, me, and Jesus. Come on, you're saying, yep, yep, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I'm looking, I see those eyes. Anybody else? I see those eyes. Anybody else? I'm still looking. You wanna, you wanna be included. If I don't see your eyes, just... Just slip your hand up for a second. I'll look. Thank you, Lord. I'm looking around. Thank you, Jesus. Are there anybody else? I see those eyes. I see those eyes. Anybody else? Come on, you want to pray that prayer? I see those eyes. Come on, you want to do it. Don't, don't miss another opportunity. This is it. A point in eternity right here starts you saying yes to him. Thank you, Lord. I see those eyes. Anybody else? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I see those eyes. Anybody else? Come on, I don't want to miss anybody. You still got time. You want to do this. We're going to pray. God's going to come in. He's going to be brand new, brand new. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
Let's pray this prayer together with those who are saying, yes, God, take, have my life, take my life. I'm serving you from this day forward. Let's pray this prayer together. Let's mean it from our hearts. Can we do that? Pray this after me. Father God, I believe Jesus is Lord. He is your son. And he came to this earth. He died for my sins. And God, you raised him from the dead. Jesus, I'm asking you, come into my life. Be my savior and my Lord. Make me brand new. Fill me with that peace with that joy, and with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Come on, God did something brand new on the inside. Here at Westside, we're all about helping you grow in your walk with God, and we want to help you in any way that we can. If you've made a decision to follow Jesus today, we'd love to send you some free materials to help you jumpstart your faith journey. Just go to wcspokane.com slash connect and mark the box that says, I'm committing my life to Jesus. This is the best decision that you could ever make and we want to help you in any way that we can. Have a blessed week and remember, Jesus is coming soon.